good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you with us as we celebrate the Festival of the Reformation. The, uh, the screen says it's Reformation Day. It is not Reformation Day. Reformation Day is Tuesday. Tuesday, Halloween is Reformation Day. Pastor Gene will talk a little bit about that later. If you don't quite catch it in the sermon, you can always ask us later what the connection is between ghosts and goblins and Martin Luther. There is a connection, believe it or not. So um, thank you for being with us as we celebrate. Thank you to our musicians who help us with a little bit of added zest as we celebrate Reformation Day and Reformation Sunday this weekend. Uh, please remember to pass the pew pads. That is always helpful to us. Uh, a couple other things you need to know. Uh, we, are, we are up for the cookies at uh, Campus Ministry at UWL on Wednesday of this week. So if you signed up to provide cookies, please make sure we have them tomorrow. Uh, I think tomorrow's the day we want them, right? Because they got to be down there by Wednesday. So um, please, please make sure you get those in. Uh, as you leave worship, out on the table right over here are two cards for some of our shut-ins. Uh, Meryl Kirking and Virgil Michelson are the two people this week. Whether you know them or not, please sign the cards. We have heard repeatedly from families how meaningful that is to, um, to, to, to the people who are homebound. And while it is always wonderful for them to be able to say, oh, look, somebody I know signed the card, in some ways it's even more powerful when somebody they don't know takes the time to re let them know that they're being thought of. So even if you don't know them, please, please sign the cards. Um, Norwegian dinner this coming week. Uh, please, please join us on Saturday for the Norwegian dinner. If you have not yet signed up, there, I'm sure there are still spots where you can be worked in. We do have one thing that we are looking for a little bit. We have run into a major difficulty with the dishwasher. Um, Jeff Haldeman has spent hours Hours, I mean hours, like maybe close to 10 hours over the last couple weeks on it is just not getting there. We do have a dishwashing crew, but they are kind of constructed to use the dishwasher. So if you could, you know, like put in an extra hour somewhere along the line to help with the dishes, the crew would be, would be very grateful if you could say, you know, I can come in for an hour and just help dry some dishes or get them out of the way. Uh, so please keep that uh, in mind as the week goes on. If you can be a part of that, please let us know. Um, we have two prayer concerns that we want to lift up this morning. Marilyn Genevico had surgery earlier in the week. Uh, she should be home by now, uh, but we want to keep her in our prayers. We also want to keep Kathy Morgan and her family in our prayers on the death of her father, Robert, um, earlier this week. So please keep Kathy and her family in your prayers as they grieve his loss. Our worship begins with confession and forgiveness. As you are comfortable, would you please rise? Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus, who bears the cross, the Spirit, who makes our joy complete. Let us bow before God in humility confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. We continue with singing hymn number 504.
we continue on page 98 in the front of the hymnal, please note that when we complete the Kyrie, we jump to page 100 and 101 for This is the Feast. Page 98. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all the enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the 31st chapter of the prophet Jeremiah. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. At this time, I would invite Weston and Clara to come forward. Weston is going to receive his Bible, his third grade Bible this morning. So we invite you to come forward. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come down by you. When your mom brought you for baptism, she promised to place in your hands the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, to nurture your life in faith and in prayer, to share with others the message of Christ through word and deed, to care for others in all that God has made, and to work for the mercy, justice, and peace of God wherever you are. On that same day, this or another congregation promised to help your mom fulfill that promise. Today, we join together in taking an important step toward fulfilling these promises. But before I give you your Bible, Weston, I need to ask your mom to recommit to the promises that she's already made to God on behalf of you. So I ask you, Clara, in the presence of God, this congregation, and Weston, will you continue in the promises you made to God in baptism? If so, please answer yes with the help of God. All right. So, Weston, the Bible that your mom's going to give you in a minute is a gift from your congregational family, so from us, okay? And these are by a study Bible, which is meant to be read and used and marked up. You can write in it. Is that cool? You can write in your Bible. Yay. And uh, when, when you get it, you'll be able to look. Your mom already wrote in it. So there's already writing in it. Cool? OK. So when you come across something that's important or special, you can highlight it or write it. Or if you something in Sunday school or confirmation when you get that far, anything that's important to you, you can mark it in your Bible. So you have permission to write in your Bible. OK? Cool. All right. So Clara, as you give Weston your Bible, his Bible, put your left hand on his shoulder, look him in the eye, and repeat after me. May this word of God, May this word of God be, a lamp to your feet be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And a light to your path. May the mind of God, the mind of God bring, you bring you wisdom beyond what I can provide. May the living word of God shine in our family, in all we do and say. Today I keep my promise to present you with the Holy Scriptures, and I renew my promise to lead our family in the ways of God. Amen. So let us pray. Gracious God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless this Bible, the parent who gave it, and the child who received it. Speak your word to them so that they may know the promise of your love, trust the goodness of your grace, follow the way that leads from darkness into light, and live as your child now and forever. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There you go, Weston. Have fun. As you are comfortable, would you please rise for the gospel acclamation. Mm -hmm. The Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, 
and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So what's all the fuss about today? Red pyramids and a brass band, don't they sound great? And our new technology, keep your eyes on the screen during the sermon. And ironically, new technology is an important part of why we are celebrating today. But that will come later. Today is a festival day. It's Reformation Day. The day we remember Martin Luther posting his 95 theses on the doors of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, over 500 years ago. For years, in the Lutheran church at least, this day has been celebrated. Celebrated, but for what? For history, for theology, for red banners? The Reformation is a critical moment in history with names, dates, and places. It is also theological. Martin Luther was up to something as he pondered how God works in our world and as he saw the things that maybe weren't quite the way they should be in the church. And it's a tourist delight. Imagine standing on the cobblestone streets surrounded by buildings that Luther frequented. So let's start with the fun. Let's be tourists on a journey in Wittenberg. In 2019, Pastor John, Rebecca, and I traveled to Germany, and we spent a day going back in time to the Reformation. We took the train from Berlin, about an hour or so, down to the town of Wittenberg. When you get off the train, you step back in time. In a lot of ways, Wittenberg is still the town that it was back in Luther's time. The architecture is very quintessential German. We walked on the very same cobblestone streets that Luther did. That thought still gives me goosebumps. But there are a few differences. Martin Luther had a number of children, but I doubt he ever shopped for Christmas presents at the Lego store. And if he went out for a bite to eat, he probably didn't go to the Wittenberger and get Ben and Jerry's ice cream nor did he shop at the New Yorker. And I don't imagine anyone belonged to the Lions Club. Oh, and there were no English worship services in the church. For the most part, the town is fairly well preserved. And one of the first stops is the Luther House, or the Black Cloister, as it was called. Martin Luther lived in the Black Cloister as a monk when it was a monastery. When Martin married Katie, she moved into the monastery with him. But as time went on, the need for a monastery decreased, and eventually the Luthers were gifted with this building by the town of Wittenberg, and it became their house. Over the years, the building has been extensively remodeled, so the interior really doesn't look like it did when they were there. Today, the Luther House, or Black Cloister, it's a museum with displays of books, artwork, documents, even music from the Reformation era. The picture on the screen is the oldest known copy of a mighty fortress. We'll come back here in a few minutes. A couple of doors down from the Black Cloister is the home of Philip Melanchthon. While Luther was the insightful brain, Melanchthon did the theological heavy lifting for the Reformation writing down and articulating the theological concepts that Luther and the Reformers embraced. The Melanchthon House is also a museum, but unlike the Luther House, it is, has not been extensively remodeled, and much of it is pretty much the way it was, as you can see from the pictures. If you continue down the main street into Wittenberg, you come to the center of town and to the town church. The town church is where Martin Luther was the pastor and where he preached his sermons. This is where he did his pastoral work. Again, this building has been refreshed over the years, 
I'm not really sure if the organ is original, and I'm certain that the pulpit is not. Certainly, a lot of the artwork is not, because a lot of it is post-Reformation artwork. We'll come back to that later, too. Further down on towards the other end of town is another church, the Castle Church. And this is the church where the Reformation got its start in 1517. Martin Luther was greatly disturbed by much of the theology of the time, especially the sale of indulgences. Indulgences were a fee that you could pay to buy someone out of purgatory and into heaven, and the proceeds used for the work of the church. The concept was bad enough, but in Luther's time, the money raised went to build buildings in Rome. Luther decided he needed to bring those things up for discussion with other scholars at the university. There were 95 theses, or statements, that Luther wanted to discuss. The way to articulate these theses was to post them publicly so that the other scholars could see them, and then you got together over a beer and talked about them. So on the evening before All Saints, when all the community would come to worship, including the scholars, Luther wrote up his 95 theses in Latin, the language of the scholars, and nailed them to the door of the castle church. Luther posted these theses on the door in this spot, but the door, of course, was wood. Wood burns, and so it did about 150 years ago. It was then replaced by this bronze door with the 95 theses engraved in the bronze doors. Right spot, new door. But back to Luther. Luther believed it was safe to write his statements in Latin as only the scholars could read Latin. What Luther did not yet grasp was the power of the latest technology of the day, the greatest invention of the last millennium, the printing press. Someone read Luther's theses, thought it was dynamite stuff, translated them into German, and then printed them. Within weeks, people all around Germany were reading Luther's criticism and critique of the church, and in particular, indulgences. That's how the snowball of the Reformation started down the hill, and it started right here in the castle church. Inside the castle church are a series of beautiful stained glass windows. Enjoy them for just a moment. But also, maybe a bit less enjoyable, the graves of Luther and Melanchthon. We happen to be there on a Thursday, and remember that sign a few minutes ago about the English language services? Thursdays at 3 o'clock? We were able to worship in the church where Luther is buried and where the Reformation got started. In fact, Pastor John even got to read a lesson during the worship, which was kind of a special thing, because although this is the place where the Reformation started, Martin Luther never preached in this building. Remember, he was the pastor of the town church, and that is where he preached. So there you go, Martin. Pastor John got to do something you never got to do. <laughs> but the Reformation is more than a sightseeing excuse or even an historical event. It is, at its heart, a theological moment, a moment where God worked particularly in Martin Luther, but also in people like Philip Melanchthon and others, to reveal more clearly and purely what God is about in our world. And so let's go back down the street from the castle church to the black cloister, the Luther house, and the museum inside. Among the displays is one of the oldest copies of Luther's translation of the Bible in German. Now the Bible, of course, goes back 2,000 years, and the Reformation only goes back 500 years. But one of the things that Luther believed very strongly in was the ability of people to read scripture in their own language. Up until Luther's time, the Bible was pretty much written in either Latin or in a very highly educated form of German. So one of the things that Luther did was to take the time to go back to the original languages of Greek and Hebrew and to translate the Bible into Low German for the common folk. This weekend, our third graders are receiving their Bibles. 
We had a Bible workshop for them earlier this month where we talked about how Luther was instrumental in translating the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into German. And then over the years, it's been translated into over 700 different languages, including, of course, English. But Luther understood that there is more at stake than simply the Bible. Yes, the Lutheran reformers used the phrase sola scriptura, only scripture, and that scripture is the highest authority. But Luther also believed in what he called a canon within a canon. That is to say that within scripture, there are some parts more important than others, some which speak directly to God's work to bring life and hope, God's work of salvation. As Pastor John taught the third graders, the Bible is not a set of rules to live by or advice on living a good life. The Bible is the revelation of the greatest love story, God at work in Jesus. So let's leave the Luther house and go back downtown to the town church where Luther preached and take you up to the altar. Here is the altar scene up in the front of the church, and there are a number of paintings on the altar. Look particularly at the painting in the bottom center. In this painting by Luth Lucas Cranach the Elder, there were worshipers on the left and Luther on the right, preaching the word of God. But notice what Luther is doing. He is pointing to the image of Christ in the center of the picture. Luther understood that all of scripture, all of preaching, all of what we do and what we are as a community of faith points to the crucified Jesus Christ, points to what God does in our world. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you heard Pastor Joan from Bethany in Mauston talk about how for Lutherans, the heart of our theology is the affirmation that God comes down into our world. God is the actor. God is the doer. In the person of Jesus, God acts in our world and in our lives. That our hope in the midst of a broken, troubled world isn't about us. It's not how, in how hard we work or how much we do or how clever or how smart we could be. It's about God working in us. God working in us in the person of the crucified and risen Jesus. Because in the end, it's the crucified and risen Jesus who takes upon himself all the brokenness, vulnerability, hurt, and pain, and sinfulness. But Luther went one step further. The Jesus who takes all that upon himself gives us, in exchange, new life. That is the gift of the Reformation, to refocus our attention on the crucified Jesus. And that's why we continue to celebrate the Reformation today not because some wonderful thing happened 500 years ago, not to pat ourselves on the back because we're Lutherans and we got it right, but rather to remind us that it's about the crucified Jesus and our need for the Holy Spirit to keep refocusing us and repointing us to what God is doing in Jesus because there is where God is at work in our lives and in the world around us. And so we celebrate the Reformation this weekend. We took a tour, studied a bit of history, yet in the end, it's about Jesus. But as this week unfolds, Reformation Day is Tuesday. Remember, the day before November 1st, the day before All Saints Day. Don't leave Jesus behind in the church. Let the Holy Spirit refocus you on Tuesday and every other day of the week on Jesus. And then look around our world, in your life, and ahead into an always uncertain future. Live faithfully with the crucified and risen Christ as your focus, as the center of all that you do and all that you proclaim in the midst of a very hurting and broken world. Amen. As you are comfortable, would you please rise as we sing hymn number 517, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word.
Would you please join me in our profession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our life, we pray for the life and the wholeness of your people who are hurting this day. We pray for peace in our world, in our very troubled world. We pray for peace in Europe and in the Middle East. We also pray for those persons around us who seek your healing touch. We pray for Marilyn. We pray that you continue to work in her the gifts of healing and wholeness. And we pray for Kathy and her family as they grieve the loss of her father. Comfort them, hold them in your care, renew and restore their confidence in the promises that you make and that you keep. God of grace. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another.
You may be seated. It is Hungry Jar and Mission Moment. Um, if you want to come running up. Weston's here. Somebody wants to bring something up for the Hungry Jar. Uh, Weston, I'm sure, will be happy to make the delivery. Um, <clears throat> the Hungry Jar this month, last Sunday for, that, for this month, is for the uh, shipping of the quilts. Remember a couple weeks ago we sent out the quilts, sent out 310 quilts and 110 school kits, and um, our Hungry Jar this month is for supporting that. Weston, I see one all the way in the back. All the way in the back. There, there's one. So, um, <clears throat> so while he's doing that, I want to share with you another one of our ministries, our prayer shawl ministry. One of our silent behind the scenes ministries is our prayer shawl ministry. A group of folk, four to six or so, gather here in the building twice a month to work together with a bit of conversation on the side. Others work at home and bring the shawls in periodically. Either way, prayer shawls are completed in love and care. When the shawls are completed, they are lifted up in prayer by the group members and then they are blessed at a worship service by one of the pastors. Shawls are given for a variety of reasons, for illness, hospitalization, shut-ins, grieving, or other needs. Shawls are also gifted to older children or adults being baptized and to parents of high school graduates. In addition, each year, a number of shawls have been given to the residents at Lakeview Healthcare Center and occasionally to medical units in La Crosse. It's important for you to know that the shawls are available for anyone, not only members of this congregation. A request to one of the pastors or a member of the group is all that is necessary to wrap someone you know in the love of our Savior Jesus Christ, as well as being wrapped in the love and prayers of our saviors. We have been blessed by generous monetary donations, often memorials, or the gift of yarn itself, these gifts allow the donor to become part of that ministry. And so we thank those who are part of that ministry, those who make the shawls <clears throat> and those who have contributed toward them. But we also thank you as a congregation. Your financial support makes this ministry of prayer to people in great need possible by provided, providing the space and the opportunity for the prayer shawls to be crafted. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of hurting people by providing a ministry of hope in Jesus. As you are comfortable, would you please rise? Would you join me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, 
we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Would you please join me in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, and live. As you receive the sacrament, we'll be singing uh, Lamb of God, uh, along with hymn number 499. Please remember that we do have gluten-free wafers in addition to the standard wafers, and we have grape juice in addition to the wine. Come, for all is ready. You may be seated. As you're comfortable, would you please rise and would you pray with me? Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. We continue with singing the closing hymn, hymn number 665. Go in peace. God is at work in you.